Welcome, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 7. We are working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We are in the last chapter uh, for this year. So chapter 7 is where we, where we find ourselves. And the whole Sermon on the Mount, or the sermon at the beginning, we have called it as well, is found in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. And that's where uh, it's located. You can read everything that Jesus talks about uh, throughout that. This morning we're in verses 15 through 20. Uh, Jesus, we, we said he's kind of wrapping this up, and he's talking and making these contrasts. And so this morning when he talks about two trees, he's doing that around the whole concept of false prophets. And are we evaluating the teaching that we are hearing from God's word? Uh, how do we evaluate that? How do we look at that and say, is this what we're supposed to be doing? Is this the truth or not the truth? Because I am, I'm telling you, even like we are streaming on YouTube like probably every other church since 2020, you can listen to almost anybody on YouTube, okay? And probably people have sent you links, oh, you ought to listen to this guy, and you should hear this guy. And so uh, you might do it in that format. I do it more probably in podcasts. People say, oh, you got to listen to this guy. How do you evaluate those? How do you look at those and say, is this right? Should I be listening to this? Are they actually teaching the word? You should be doing that, by the way, every Sunday, okay? When, when either I'm up here, Pastor Ryan's up here, okay? You ought to be evaluating that. Is this right? It, it, examine the scriptures, as we're going to see, and find out and discover for yourself. That is what we're supposed to be doing as we're going to see Jesus teach this and help us with this. So here we go. Watch out. Some of your translations will say, beware for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Okay, they look, they look like everybody else. They're so nice, they're so kind, but inwardly they are voracious wolves. Okay, uh, inside what you can't see is they're ferocious and you would want nothing to do with them. But they look good on the outside. They sound at times very good. You will recognize them by their fruit. And this is going to be a concept we're going to talk about today. Grapes are not gathered from thorns or figs from thistles. This would be the common uh, crop of the day. Jesus was probably, uh, as many scholars believe, speaking in certain fields and areas around. And he could have stand and said, do you get a grape from that? And they're like, no, we pull those out, right? They're a pain, okay? Do you get figs from these things? No, no, we don't do that. He, he probably was doing something just like that. So they understood, well, no, you don't go to something like that. And so he continues. He said, in the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree, the diseased tree, the tree that you know you should cut down before a windstorm comes and knocks it into your house, that tree bears bad fruit. The only thing that's going to come out of that tree is bad because it's bad, it's diseased, it's rotten. A good tree is not able to bear bad fruit but nor a bad tree to bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will recognize them by their fruit. Now this is incredible, by their fruit. That's the statement that he is going to make. He wants them to understand this, that by their fruit, you're going to know who they are. So are you looking at that? Are you deciphering that and looking at that as you think about this whole thing called fruit? Are you considering that? So we're going to look at that today. I want to help us understand that because this, again, is one of those things. Are we really following Jesus? Are those people you listen to their podcast to and you read their blog, are they really following Jesus? Are they? Great question. You ought to be asking that. And Jesus is going to help us kind of pull things apart and go, oh, are these people really following Jesus? Are they teaching what you should be listening to and applying to your life? Beware false prophets. So how do you recognize a false prophet? Well, Jesus says by their fruit, okay? So fruit, in, in kind of the definition that Jesus is using, is anything done in true partnership with Christ. If you, if you went into the book of John, Jesus talks about, I am the vine, Right? You're the branches. You want to bear fruit? You have to do that with me. Because apart from me, it says you can't do anything 
Jesus puts out. Makes it really, really plain. Without me, you can't do anything. So, then what is the fruit of a false prophet? I want you to see this. Some of you were with us this summer when we were in 2 Peter. Second, Peter tells us. Peter tells us a couple things that we ought to be looking for, and we're going to focus in on one of these things today. We're going to focus on one of these things today. Here we go. But false teachers arose from among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Peter's like, it shouldn't surprise you. You shouldn't be like, oh, man, that person's really, he's really got scripture all twisted up and mingled. Yes, don't be surprised by that. They're going to come up, okay? They're going to come up. They're going to rise. Be prepared for that. They will rise up among you. These false teachers will infiltrate your midst with what? Destructive heresies. Words. This is words. They are going to take scripture and they're going to twist it. They're going to take it out of context. And I'm telling you, you can make this book say anything you want it to say if you get stuff out of context. And you, you mix this and match that and twist this. You can make this say all sorts of things. And he says, that's what they're going to do. So you need to pay attention to their words. Their words are saying something. Even to the point of denying the master who bought them. They de- they'll, they'll deny Christ ultimately, okay? Because they, they will do that. As a result, they will bring swift destruction on themselves. He continues. And many will follow their debauched lifestyle. So now their life is actually all messed up because their beliefs are wrong, their teachings wrong, their doctrines wrong. It's going to show up in their life. Because of these false teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. And in their greed, they will exploit you with what? Deceptive words. This is going to be our focus this morning, is the words, not just the lifestyle. The, the lifestyle is, is a separate point we could talk about, but I want to focus on the words this morning of the false prophet, of the false teachers that come out. That there are destructive heresies, there are deceitful words, and there are debauched lifestyles. They are, they are living apart from what Scripture says we should live, but a lot of times we don't know that. You just saw them on YouTube, right? You listen to a podcast. You have no idea what goes on for the other uh, rest of the week and time. They're not recording this or writing this or on YouTube. You have no idea. So sometimes we don't know the lifestyle, but we can tell the heresies and the words. So are you looking, this is the question, are you looking for this fruit? Are you searching? Are you listening to what you're hearing and are you searching out the scriptures that we're going to talk about this morning to understand, are they teaching what is right? How are their words doing as the fruit of their life, as the fruit of their ministry? And we're going to start with the church in Berea because Paul commended this church and he did it for a reason. Now, when Paul would go into a town because there were Jewish synagogues everywhere, that's what he would start. And the reason he would start there is because they have a base of knowledge, right? They have heard of God, okay? They know there's a Messiah coming, and so that's why he would always go there, and he would start there, and he would say, oh, yeah, you already know this, this, and this. Now, I want to introduce you. The Messiah has come. He has gave his life. He rose on the third day, so he would always start there in synagogues, and sometimes it would go well. Most of the time, it did not, and then you'll read this little Par- this little sentence about, well, we got kicked out of that synagogue, okay? So it, it, that's how well it went, okay? Except when they went to Berea. And, and we're only told a very little bit about this church, a very little bit about the people in the synagogue in Berea. Never shows up. We don't have a, we don't have a first Berea, a second Berea. We don't have any of that, okay? So we just have this statement about this church that, Paul, Silas is with him. We know that Luke also is with him. And Luke is writing and recording this for us. And so here we are, the church in Berea. What does it say? These Jews were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And this is, what, this is one of those weird words that appears in Scripture. This is the only place it appears, and we have no idea basically what it means. Okay? Uh, some of your translations will say noble-minded. 
because we're like, uh, is it noble-minded? Is it open-minded? What does noble-minded mean? I have no idea. It's one of those. We don't know. I'm leaning more towards, you know what they did? And it's going to say what they did here. They were critical thinkers. In other words, he walked in and say, oh, it's Paul. Paul never says anything wrong. We're going to listen to everything he says. And they didn't do that, as you're going to see here. They all suddenly go, oh, no, it's Paul. We've heard all about this guy. Get him out. Get him out. Okay? They actually were going to listen to what he said. They were going to evaluate it, as you're going to see. They were going to be critical thinkers. They weren't just going to say, oh, I saw this ad on TV. It must be right. No, no. They weren't going to do that. They weren't going to do that. They were actually going to critically think their way through. So it says what? For they eagerly received the message and did what? Examined the scriptures carefully each day to see if these things were so. So in a synagogue, this is how it would work. Paul's up there. He's, he's teaching them. And then they're like, huh, hey, hey, go get the Isaiah scroll. Because the only thing they had at this point is, the Old, is our Old Testament. So no chapters, no verses, okay? This is a scroll. And all depend what book they picked, it was long, okay? So imagine it. Hey, go get Isaiah. I know, I know something Paul just said came out of there. And there they go. Open the scroll. There it is. There it is. He's right. He was right all the time when he was speaking. Because they did what? They did not take Paul's word for it. They took scripture for scripture. And when, oh, we're going to examine this. We're going to understand what's going on so we know what's really happening. So are you listening and examining the scriptures? When you listen to a podcast, when you read a blog, when you see those things, are you doing that? And I know we're really talking condensed here. We're talking about the world of scripture. What are we doing when we hear somebody teach scripture, speak of scripture, refer to scripture? Okay? What are we doing? Are you listening and examining the scripture? So, let me give you an example what I'm talking about. This example was not supposed to be this long, okay? I'm I'm just going to say, sometimes you get on rabbit holes when you're you're just checking some things out, okay? So, I want to take you back to the book of Deuteronomy for a moment, and then I want to skip ahead to Jesus' words, okay? Here we go. Whenever a prophet speaks in my name, this is from the book of Deuteronomy, and the prediction is not fulfilled... Then I have not spoken. It's the prophet has presumed to speak it. So you need not fear him. In other words, no, you don't know what they're talking about. Okay? Now, weigh that in. We have it much better because we had scripture now. Okay? To examine stuff. But he goes, do you understand? They're making predictions. It's not happening. Nope. You're done. You're done. Okay? Now, Jesus' words. You are not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. In context of Acts chapter 1, do you know what they want to know? Is this where you're going to set up your kingdom? Are you, is this when we're in charge? Okay? This is when you throw out the Romans. They wanted the second coming then. They wanted the second advent then. Jesus is in charge. He has set up his kingdom. Great. And here's Jesus' statement. You are not permitted to know the times or periods. This is really simple. Okay? I don't know why we get this wrong, as I will point out in a moment. You're not permitted to know the times. The Father has set those by his own authority. Okay? Do you know how many fake predictions there's been the return of Christ? I shouldn't have gone down this rabbit hole. Okay? I started this rabbit hole, and I don't know if any of you remember this, but in 1988, the 88 reasons that Jesus will return in 1988. I don't know if any of you remember that. Okay, that sold like almost 5 million copies. See, and what I don't understand is why on January 1st, 1989, everybody go, okay, this guy's wrong. Why did we ever listen to him again? Oh, no. Oh, no, he wasn't done there. See, this is, right, he wasn't done there because he also wrote in 1989. Whoops, off a gear, right? He continued in 1993 and 1994. And it's like, what? 
what do you, what do, you do? And he, and he had a time period. He believed it was going to be between September 11th and September 13th of 1988. Based on, based on you know, his predictions, he, he figured out something that Jesus said you don't have the authority to figure out. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. So I thought, well, that's it. I just, I just wanted to let you know this guy's name was Edgar Wisenhunt or Wisenent or something like that. That there he is, okay? Except when you do that, it says, oh, by the way, don't pick on poor Edgar because he isn't the only one who's done this. This has happened over and over again. This has happened in 1844. April 18th, 1844 was supposed to be the coming of Christ. I, I'm telling you, it goes on. And it doesn't matter what group, okay? Oh, yeah, not my group. Oh, yeah, yeah, your group, right? What it, whatever you think your group is, okay, and, and, you know, whatever your denomination, whatever your team, all of them did it. All of them have done this. So many have done this, okay? Uh, one did it after World War I. Oh, this is it. It's Armageddon. It's all over. And over and over, even the Catholics, even the Catholics, whether you knew it or not, Erasmus, and Erasmus is one who developed a lot of the Greek that went into the King James Bible, that's Erasmus. Now, when Martin Luther split from the church, okay, and they excommunicate him and that, that big disaster, right, that, that took place there, and the Protestant Reformation in which they were just trying to get everybody back to Scripture. Do you know what was predicted? That Martin Luther was a monk and he's not supposed to get married. Married a nun, she's not supposed to get married either, okay? And so they were convinced, and Erasmus taught this, that their child would be the Antichrist, okay? We figured it all out. And I'm serious, this is, and this is over. This happened in 2011, did you know that? By a man by the name of Harold Camping. May 21st, 2011, Christ is coming back. And over and over it goes. Whether, what do you want, the Lutherans, the Mennonites, over and on. It's unbelievable. Like, this isn't hard. This isn't hard. As soon as you give a date, I've told you this before, as soon as you give a date, you're done. It's really simple in Scripture, okay? I, I, I've told you, I listened to a guy, and I, I really enjoyed him because, you know, the, the way he taught prophecy. Until I'm watching him, and he goes, well, the other day I was studying the book of Barnabas, and I'm like, time out. Wait a minute. Like, I memorized the books. I don't think that's in there, okay? And I'm flipping, no, oh, okay, we, we got something wrong. He, he's in now a non-canonical book. He's in a book outside of Scripture. What is he doing? Oh, and because he studied the book of Barnabas, he has a date. Click. I've never watched him again. You're done. You're done at that point. You have done something that God says, don't. You don't know. You don't, I don't know why every, every single person that said this would say, well, it's time out. Are you saying you're God? Because you must be saying you're God. Because Jesus said, the Father said all those things by authority. A lot of it is, oh, I'm going to be super smart, and I'm going to figure out the secret code in the Bible, and I'm going to figure out... The... No, no. We, we have got to do a better job evaluating and seeing the fruit that comes from false prophets. Because whether we understand it or not, they will continue on, and they will take more people down with them. One of my favorite ones, the 80s. For everybody alive in the 80s, the famous Jim Baker, PTL Club, right? That entire scandal that took place. And amazed, and to my amazement, Jim Baker just moved to Branson and started up again. And whether you know it or not, the state of Missouri had to go after him. The reason they had to go after him is that, that he, had, he had a person on at COVID who said, this is it. This is it, folks. Just take this. You're perfect. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, everything will be fine. A and the state of Missouri actually had to go after him and said, you can't do that. You can't do that. So 150 some odd thousand later, who knows how many people later. I'm just telling you, there, there's this stuff. And you have to be evaluating what people and preachers are saying. The people that you're listening to, you're like, oh, I love their Bible studies. And, and they're so nice and so kind. They might be a wolf. And you know how you're going to figure that out? You're going to listen. You're going to open this and go, huh, I don't know about this. Because there's lots of it in our days. 
And you have to listen and evaluate. Just as every Sunday, you ought to be listening and evaluating me. You might have to walk in and say, Ed, I think you got that wrong. You might have to say that. You might have to go to an elder and say that. Hey, I, I, I don't know. Ed said this. I don't know if this is accurate. I was reading this the other day. But we don't do that. We don't do that. And our busy lives are like, oh my goodness, I don't have time for that. Gosh, I barely got time to come to church and sit down and go, come on, Ed, faster, faster, faster. We got lots to do today. And you're like, I don't have time to evaluate. Make some time. You better be in Scripture. If you're in Scripture, this stuff is going to stick out to you and you're going to go, oh, oh, that's that's not right. Why, Why am I following that? Why am I listening to that? Now, you might say, oh, why does it matter? Well, I'm going to tell you, first of all, when you hear someone like that, this list of people, they are disqualified. Stop listening to them. Stop supporting them. Stop buying their materials. Okay? Stop. Just stop. All the people, I, I, I heard this about Jim Bay. I'm wondering, you know, my, my parents, I think, supported them in the day, okay? So I, I can't, can you imagine how many people are still writing out their checks? Oh, man, we love Jim Baker. Oh, he's such a nice guy. Why? We don't suppo- support false teachers and prophets. We don't. They're disqualified. Stop. Stop. Now, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Oh, does it really matter? They're, they're trying to help people. Maybe they get a few things wrong, but they're really trying to help. Why does it matter? You know why? Did you catch this from our reading in Second Peter? The way of truth will be slandered. Oh, so they're slander. They, they, they end up slandering the way of truth. And a lot of people get confused. There's a lot of people that walk away then from this because of that. Because they were hurt and they were taken advantage of. And, and, and they, were, they, they were pointed out and they were, they were targeted and they were swindled. The way of truth gets slandered. And that certainly is not pleasing to our Lord and Savior. So, God will judge the false prophets. Did you catch that at the end? The bad tree gets cut down. They, they get dealt with. God deals with them. Okay? Our job, recognize and avoid. Recognize and avoid. Do you know somebody else that's doing that? Go, really? Well, how do you, how do you equate that with what God says here? Didn't they, didn't they give a date? Don't, don't let them give you a date. That's not right. But I want to end with this because th- this is really, th- this is really, while it's easy to say, oh man, look at that false teacher and that one, and right, look at these people giving dates. It's easy to do that, right? The hard part is, do, do you understand? The, the fruit is the words. So if, so can I ask you, now this is the hard part, just like, oh man, can we go back to all the fun stuff, right? All, all the guys, it's, what do our words say? Are our words bearing the fruit of Jesus in our lives? Yeah, but I'm not a teacher. Yeah, you're teaching every day. You're teaching every day in, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. By your words, you're saying whether or not you trust Christ as your Savior. That's what your words, you, you, are, you are doing that with your life, with your words, every single day. We don't think of it that way. Well, I'm not up front. I don't have to, yeah, I know. Because scripture says those who get to teach, man, <laughs> they, they're double accountable. They, they got more accountability, okay? Not, le- not, not less, okay? They, they have more accountability. That doesn't mean the rest of us, the rest of you have none, it's you have accountability. Every idle word will be accounted for, Jesus says. On top of that, so we're all accountable. And then those of us who get to open the word and teach it get double accountability. It's even more. It's even more. So that's, all, that's how I want to wrap this this morning. I want us to think, what are my words saying? What are my words communicating? In my house, 
in my school, in my place of employment, when I'm out, when I'm doing things, when I'm in the car, what are my words saying? What type of fruit are they producing? Because that's going to help you find some personal application to the word this morning. It's first of all, what what are you listening, reading to, watching that needs to stop? They are false prophets. Stop listening to them. Stop buying their stuff. And then it's, what are my words saying? What's the fruit that they are producing in the world around me? And I want us to think about that, that we would evaluate, that we would repent if necessary, that we would learn, and that we would move forward. So, let's pray, and our worship team's going to come up and lead us in a, a final song. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to help us today. Because... Sometimes we're not very good at this, at this evaluation. And sometimes we're supporting with our time, our sometimes our money. Sometimes we're out buying their book. And they're teaching contrary to you. It it's a disease. And it's happening in many churches. The disease tree is just wreaking havoc across our country and in many churches today where people will stand up and they will teach contrary to your word. I pray for ears to hear that we would evaluate And that you would help us to examine the scripture to make sure the teaching is right and honorable and what you have laid before us. But then the personal application part also is, what are my words doing? What's the fruit they're producing? Are are, are we a diseased tree just putting out rotten fruit? Nobody wants And we might think, ah, it doesn't matter. We're slandering Jesus your way when we do such a thing. And we don't want to do that anymore. So would you help us to examine, to look at what teaching we allow into our lives? And would you ask, would you help us to know what type of fruit our words are producing in our homes, in our work, and everywhere we happen to be. May we become people where our words honor and glorify you, build up others, speak truth in love. And our good fruit that accomplishes great things. Jesus, work in our hearts and lives that we would walk in a way to honor you and your word. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.